everybody here this afternoon. I'm Mary Sullivan from the South East Kent Palestine Solidarity Campaign Group. So those of you that don't know, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign is an organisation that advocates just for justice for Palestinians. It is established to campaign for the right of self-determination for the Palestinian people, for the right of return for the Palestinian people, for the immediate withdrawal of the Israeli state from the occupied territories, against oppression and dispossession suffered by Palestinian people, in support of the rights of Palestinian people and their struggles to achieve these rights, to promote Palestinian civil society in the interests of democratic rights and social justice, to oppose Israel's occupation and its aggression against neighboring states, in opposition to racism, including anti-Jewish prejudice and Islamophobia, and the apartheid and Zionist nature of the Israeli state. And now we are campaigning for an immediate and permanent ceasefire and a political solution that will bring justice for Palestinians and an enduring peace for all. So I want to hand over now to Diane Langford, a writer, trade unionist, and long-time campaigner for the Palestinian human and civil rights and the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Diane is a PSC executive mem committee member and a South East Kent uh, PSC officer. She will explain what we've been doing in Kent for the last few years. But before handing it over to Diane, I would like to thank Unite the union, the community, for donating um, to South East Kent PSC. It is very much appreciated. And thank you for coming out week upon week to end the genocide. Today, people are making their support visible all over the country, despite the freezing weather. We have to be seen. Congratulations to our magnificent students and staff at the University of Kent for defying attempts to silence them, getting active on the campus and being an inspiration. We love you and we will support you. I know there are great students at Canterbury and Christchurch and the University of the, of the Arts as well will be inspired by your example. We must do more to pressure the government and His Majesty's loyal opposition. Their support for Israel's evil, sadistic regime is a measure of how much they care about us. They are not our government. Our government would not support genocide our MPs would not support genocide. Rosie Duffield, shame on you! Shame on you! Shame on you! You don't represent us. No, no. Our MPs would have been Hugh Lanning <laughs> and Dr. Coral Jones who were candidates in Canterbury and North Kent, but their campaigns were sabotaged. What can we do? And what have we been doing? We have challenged the Archbishop of Canterbury and Archbishop Rose over their shamefully inadequate response to genocide. We've campaigned against the University of Kent's pension fund investments in complicit companies. We hold many events centering Palestinian voices and culture, including last year, May Day and International Women's Day. Palestine is a feminist issue. <laughs> Boycott divestment and sanctions work. Veolia lost its contract to collect the bins in Canterbury due to our sustained campaign against its complicity. Puma is under tremendous pressure. 
HSBC was forced to divest from Elbit, but still invests in other arms companies. Barclays Bank is continuing its support for apartheid, financing genocide. Take our Barclays postcards and give them out today. We've staged marches and rallies against Instro Elbit in Sandwich. And we need to step that up. We need you, your help, to kick Israeli weapons companies out of Kent. Take a bunch of our leaflets away with you today and distribute them widely. Inform yourself about the history of the Nakba so you can tell others that Israel is the oppressor, Palestine is the victim, and Britain is the perpetrator. Yes! Stick with us, even when the media stops reporting the ongoing Nakba, even when it's freezing, even if it's snowing, until Palestine is liberated from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Shahad Hamouri. Uh, she is a Palestinian law lecturer at the University of Kent and a writer on political economy of the Middle East and North Africa. Thank you. Um, when, when I was asked uh, yet again to speak this week, to be honest, I, the first question is, what on earth am I going to say? When I was asked, I, there was still a, a pause or a truce. So, uh, and we were still thinking, wondering what on earth is going to happen. During the truce, hundreds of people were still being targeted in the West Bank. Over tens of people were killed in the West Bank. Thousands are still in prison. Hundreds more were taken out of prison. Some of us indulged ourselves by watching the videos of the released prisoners, looking at them as they were re re reunited with their families, asking ourselves how many precious family moments we are, were these women and children deprived of. We indulged ourselves just for a few minutes because we knew that in parallel, hundreds of others were being taken to prison. But that indulgement did not last. The moment these women spoke, we heard testimonies of the most horrible times they spent in prison, stripped naked, tortured. You could not for a second look at these women in the eye and say that this is a moment where we can rest. We could not rest. And not only that, in the very few moments when we had these videos of children recapturing their, their breath, saying that yes, we have a little bit of time to regain, to regain a sense of normal life. We were still debating. I had to go and, and talk to UK politicians. I went to talk to Rosie, look her in the eye and ask her, how on earth did you, uh, did you vote against something as simple as a ceasefire? Not, not radical, not, not even something as basic as uh, looking into Israel's international legal obligations. I wasn't even saying end the illegal occupation. I was just saying stop an ongoing genocide. Nothing more than that. She responded by saying there is multiple positions on this. I do not know, but you know there is different party politics. I do not know, but you know there is different opinions. And you know this is you guys saying. I looked at her and I'm like, this is not us saying. Don't belittle my expertise. I'm talking to you as an international legal expert. I'm talking to you with the law that your so-called Western states have created that I'm very critical of, that still has not understood what it means to be under colonization. But even that law, is, is reaching at the utmost point where, yes, it is being broken. The most simple premises of human existence are broken. I stand in front of you here to say,
that you are applying this law to some states and saying to me that it's debatable to apply it to some other states. We also saw the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court go and visit Israel last week. And you know what he did? This man who was supposed to be having studied Palestine for the past four years, that man stood in East Jerusalem, which is Palestinian territory, and posted a picture and called it Israel. Whoa. That man was supposed to be an expert. Shame. He normalized annexation. Annexation is the crime of aggression, one of the gravest illegalities in international law. And yet, because it's an ally of the UK, because it's an ally of the US, it's all right. We have begged him for over four years to go and have interviews with the families of victims affected by the Israeli occupation, but no. But then he goes and interviews the families affected by October 7th because some lives are worth more than others. Shame. Shame. It was the same with Rosie. She had sat down with families of people affected by October 7th. But when we asked her, did you talk to the families of the people in Ga from Gaza? Did you talk to Palestinian families? She didn't even know. She didn't even know that we had communities upon communities in Canterbury affected by this. She did not recognize that some of us for the past two months have had to watch a go ongoing onslaught, genocide, and then walk through the streets normally as if nothing is happening to answer the question of how are you doing and having to explain that we are going undergoing a genocide. I had to go to the foreign office and uh, as an international lawyer, so I wasn't allowed to protest, but I was allowed to ask questions as a professional. Don't you see that when you're talking about Russia, that you're applying laws to some other, so, to some people, that you're parading how happy you are to have worked towards bringing down and enacting international legal mechanisms in relation to Putin. You have worked towards getting that man an arrest warrant. Now that man cannot travel around the world. Everyone condemns what he does. And yet, you're still shaking hands with the biggest perpetrators of international law and legal history. Shame. When I asked them, how do you see your position as international lawyers, as experts, people who studied the question of justice and made it their bread and butter, their faces turned red. They couldn't answer. And they told me, we're only working after the politicians. The same answer that I got from Rosie, the same answer that I got from the Foreign Office, party politics. We are waging people's lives because of party politics. Because we're still unable to handle European guilt after World War II. Because we allowed the misappropriation of a form of guilt towards one people to be used to hide the ethnic cleansing of another people. Because we cannot look ourselves in the eye and say, Islamophobia is real and it's premised in their perception of the world. Racism is real and it's, and it's premised in how they see the world. It is premised in having to say, 20,000 people were killed. It is to say that a traumatized population of 2.2 million people have had to shift their places. Again, fifth generation of trauma, 52 years of bombardment, and then we're still discussing whether or not it is okay to bomb them again. Shame. Shame. Stop bombing Gaza! Stop bombing Gaza! Stop bombing Gaza! Stop bombing Gaza! Stop bombing children! Stop bombing children! Stop bombing children! Stop bombing children! And then I had to talk with people who worked in the arms industry and people who were looking at what type of complicity is there between different states. We analyzed what were the weapons dropped in Gaza. 
We found out that one of the most commonly dropped weapons on Gaza was 155 millimeter artillery shells. These are produced in the US, some of them come from Germany, but are dropped using UK we made weapons. And some are even having their products coming out of Kent. Oh. These weapons are their usage in a densely populated area is a direct war crime. These weapons, when I talked to the expert, he told me that they are akin to using, and they're akin to targeting like, a, like a, a flock of birds with bombs. It's insane the amount of destruction that that type of weapons can be used to produce. But they're using it on and on again. And we had to discuss where and who on earth is selling these weapons. We found value chains coming from all across Europe, all across the places. And we found the UK at the heart of that complicity and still pushing again for it. We had civil society organizations push legally to question the position of the UK in still supplying weapons on and on again. And yet, after all of this, after having to try to get some energy, some fucking strength to do this, we wake up yesterday to the news that it all started again. That people who've been traumatized for 52 days have to wake up again to the same traumatizing sound of drones above their heads. We saw Israel play lawfare. Yes, we are not targeting civilians. No, we have this realistic, legal, military ob objection, objective of killing every single member of Hamas. The problem what they can't understand is that it is an idea. The more you kill people in a densely populated area, you will not be doing anything. The only way to safeguard the lives of both Israelis and Palestinians starts with the truth, starts with justice, starts with recognizing that those people have been historically wronged. It starts with giving everyone equal rights. There is no other way. The more killing you have, the more violence you will breed, the more likely you will get traumatized generations. Between us and them are thousands upon thousands of dead bodies, traumatized generations, and they have just created more. I woke up this morning to the image of a child who's going through a seizure because he can no longer handle living under that. People were deprived of food, were deprived of basic amenities, people were arbitrarily detained, people were tortured, and people were directly bombarded. I do not understand how we live in a world where we can still see that on live TV and for it not to stop. And on that note, I recognize and I tell you here, this is our power. Thank you for coming here despite a, a frozen weather. If it's not for us speaking, I would go mad. All of the Palestinians would go collectively mad. If we see collective silence in the world, if this goes by, one generation from now, this will also be remembered as a time when people were silent. One of the only ways that people could console themselves knowing that their rock war happened, that millions went to the street and said no. The same with the war in Vietnam. And now we're doing the same with Palestine. Keep on saying it until we tell the world, this is not okay. Not to anyone is it okay. Party politics should not be a place for this to happen. Profit should not be okay at the expense of people dying. No one should ever sleep at night knowing that they made a penny out of the suffering of another human being. The word of justice has to be before politics. The word of humanity has to be before individual interest. These are basic tenets of our existence. And by standing here today, we're not only saying free Palestine, we're saying that we reject party politics over human and human beings. We reject 
the secondary racist understanding of who gets to live a good life, who gets to celebrate, who gets to go around their lives with good being, who gets to have simple family moments, and who gets to exist like we all do. We all enter this holiday season with the heaviest of hearts. Jordan has canceled every single glimpse of celebration and so have most of Arab countries. No one has a heart to say any hello to joy in the middle of this. And unless this stops, I don't know how we'll be able to breathe. And I cannot say but keep on protesting and scream with as much as you can at the top of your hearts. <laughs> free, free! Palestine! Free, free! Palestine! Free, free! Palestine! Free, free! free, free! Palestine! From the river to the sea! Palestine will be free! From the river to the sea! Palestine will be free! Free, free! Palestine! Free, free! Palestine! Free, free! Palestine! Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Shahad, for that powerful uh, speech. Um, it's now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Coral Jones, who's the chair of Doctors in Unite, a GP, and the Labour candidate in the 29th general election for North Thanet. Yeah. Thank you very much for um, inviting me today. Um, I just wanted to say that as doctors, of course, we've spent our lives trying to improve people's health and decrease in health inequalities and campaign for justice for all. But of course, war is the greatest. Sorry? Oh. Is that better? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. As doctors, we've spent our lives trying to fight for the health and well being of people to decrease health inequalities and to make people's lives generally better. But of course, war is the greatest threat to, uh, to life and health that there can possibly be. Um, there can be the escalating violence and healthcare crisis in Palestine is horrifying, and the callous response of the UK government including the Labour Party leadership, is unbelievable. Even before the latest attacks, health provision in Gaza has been severely constrained by 52 years of, of uh, occupation and, of course, since the Nakba in general. There, there's global health in 2021 compared health between Israel and the occupied Pal Palestinian territories. There's great differences between the two countries in the same, who are in the same place. The occupied territories have a significantly worse infant, child and maternal mortality. Life expectancy is reduced overall with increased mortality rates for major causes of death, such as heart disease, stroke and cancer, which are treatable if services are available. As, as I mentioned, there are severe effects on the mental well-being from trauma, particularly of children. So a major humanitarian crisis has unfolded. With its recent total closure of Gaza, Israel has left over two million Palestinians, of which more than half are children, caged in with nowhere to flee, and aid agencies unable to attend to their humanitarian and military and mil medical needs. The supply of electricity, food, water, and fuel has been cut off. So people, as the UN said in, uh, on the, two days ago, that there's likely to be more deaths from lack of basic facilities than there are even from the bombardment. Bom bombardment, bombardment, sorry. And the, um, this is an international war crime, as our previous speaker has said, to deny basic facilities to a population and to target hospitals and doctors and nurses. There's been hundreds of medical workers killed and specifically doctors seem to have been targeted, the ones who are organizing the healthcare in the Gaza Strip. There've been, some five have been arrested and are no doubt being tortured. And doctors have been deliberately killed and their families targeted, oh, sorry, are killed while they were at work. Um, 
So there's widespread clinical shortages of drugs, blood products and supplies. And this is even before the latest uh, bombing happened. And the, what, how can we explain these atrocities? How can we explain that people are willing to do this and that the government is willing to stand by and in front of the whole world kill thousands and thousands of people, including children, dying under rubble and leaving premature babies alone to die and forbidding their parents to take them away with them, which is what we saw in a, in a hospital this week during the so-called ceasefire. That, Parents were forbidden from taking their children with them and they were simply left to die and they were found to be decomposing in the hospital. It's disgusting. So a London Palestinian surgeon, Professor Ghassan Abu Sita, was, who has regularly travelled to Gaza, he was in Gaza for the first six weeks of the bombardment. He believes that destruction of the Palestinian health system is very deliberate and an Israeli war objective. The aim, he says, the aim is to make Gaza uninhabitable by destroying all components of modern life, including health care and medical care. This is a continuation of the Nakba of 1948. And so I think the question is, what can we do? And I think keeping on, uh, keeping on turning out every week is really important. Local activities are really important, not just the huge marches in London, but we need to spread the word everywhere. And I think following the BD, as consumers, we can follow the BDS recommendations and really make a difference. We need to keep going to our MPs, going to the councils and invading them as much as you can get in and saying, why are you not calling for a ceasefire? People have to be held accountable. Thank you very much for coming today. I think we have a, a student here who's going to read a poem for us. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Anissa. Here? Okay. <laughs> my name is Anissa. Um, I'm a student at the University of Kent, and I will be reading to you a poem by Michael Rosen, who is a British poem. And uh, this poem is referring to the banning of the Israeli Broadcasting Authority from when there were casualties of children from Gaza. Don't mention the children. Don't name the dead children. The people must not know the names of the dead children. The names of the children must be hidden. The children must be nameless. The children must leave this world having no names. No one must know the names of the dead children. No one must know the names of the dead children. No one must even think that the children have names. People must understand that it will be dangerous to know the names of these children. <coughs> the people must be protected from knowing the names of the children. The names of the children could spread like wildfire. The people, mo the people would not be safe if they knew the names of the children. Don't name the dead children. Don't name the dead children. Don't think of the dead children and don't say dead children. Thank you. Thank you. So our next speaker is Pat Marsh from the Green Party. Thank you, can you hear me at the back? Oh, okay, I'll shout. Can you hear me now? <laughs> so, as coordinator of Canterbury District Green Party, I'd like to make you aware of a letter Green Party co-leaders Carla Denia and Adrian Ramsey and others sent to the government and opposition a month ago. Co-leader Carla Denia said, 
The mass civilian suffering we have seen in Israel and Gaza has shocked the world. We cannot hear arguments about violence now somehow preventing further violence in future without shuddering. The lives of children cannot be bartered in this way. We are deeply concerned that neither the UK government nor the official opposition has joined international calls for a ceasefire. It is with deep regret that the Green Party feels the need to point out that at times like these, silence is complicity. Yes. We urge both the government and the Labour Party to listen to the British people, three quarters of whom want an immediate ceasefire. In the letters, the Green Party sets out how war crimes have been committed by both sides since Hamas's horrific attacks on the 7th of October. Green Party co-leader Adrian Ramsey said, the awful attacks committed by Hamas on the 7th of October were brutal violence and the hostages must be released unconditionally, but the horrific attacks we saw on that day cannot justify military actions that break international law. There is no military route to long-term safety and security for the Israeli and Palestinian peoples as they both deserve. Instead, there must be a political settlement based on the requirements of international law and beginning with an end to the occupation. The UK government should push for an internationally arbitrated once and for all settlement that fully ends the occupation of Palestinian territories, including East Jerusalem, in accordance with the requirements of international law. It used to be the case that international law was the basis of UK government policy and the positions of both Conservatives and Labour. It is deeply troubling that this seems to have been forgotten by both government and opposition. Such an abandonment will do long-term harm to Britain's already questionable reputation as a defender of the international rules-based order. Thank you. Okay, and so our last speaker is Hugh Lanning, an artist, chair of the PSD between 2009 and 2013, the Labour candidate for Canterbury in the 2015 elect general election and deputy secretary of the PSC union, PCS or PSC union until 2013. <laughs> Thank you very much. What that all meant is I'm nothing now. Uh, I'm just X everything. Um, thank you so much for coming out today. There's hundreds of places around the country that are the same demonstrations going on. And I was talking to a friend of mine in Ramallah yesterday, and they watch, they follow, they know, particularly in the UK, that we are marching in support of them, and it gives them confidence. Uh, I made a confession at the rally in London last week. I said I'm still a member of the Labour Party. <laughs> I made a second confession. I said I'd met Keir Starmer. And then I said, he's no better in real life. Uh, <laughs> but I've never been so ashamed to be a member of the Labour Party. Over 50 years membership, their stance on ceasefire is appalling. Yes. 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 There is no such thing as neutrality. If you're not supporting a ceasefire, you are agreeing with the killing and the bombing. You're saying it's okay to kill children, it's okay to bomb hospitals. And that's what, not just Labour, the government, all of the Western countries are endorsing what Israel is doing. And it's no good them saying we want to pause. It's no good them saying we want a bit of humanitarian help. Because what they're really saying is, go on and on and kill until you decide you want to stop. And that is what's happening now. It's no shock that Israel has started again. It is appalling that it hasn't been pre prevented up until now. 
And we must be clear that peace isn't a pause. Peace is ending the regime that exists, that Israel operates from the river to the sea. That means ending the occupation, ending the illegal military occupation, which sounds simple, but what that means is all Israeli troops off Palestinian land. That means bringing down the wall. That means ending the siege. That means the settlers and the settlements have to get off uh, Palestinian land. That means giving back the Palestinians their land. It means giving them the right to self-determination. That's what ending the occupation means. And that should be what we're saying is the cause and the basis of a just peace, ending the occupation. But we know that Israel is not going to go there voluntarily. It's not going to do that without pressure from governments and from around the world. They've lost the battle for public opinion, they've lost the battle for hearts and minds, but they are still entrenched. And therefore, our demand must be, yes, individual boycott, yes, companies to divest, but as we found with South Africa, it needs governments to sanction Israel because Israel has made itself illegitimate by its actions and needs to be treated as the sort of terror state that it is. And that means, therefore, no arms to Israel, no military trade with Israel, no military cooperation, no boats to Israel. We need to make sure there is no military support for what Israel is doing. And they profit from that, and we arm them, and we give them the means. And we know what happens. We see on the television every day where those arms go, how that support goes. The US Senate has been asked to put $17 billion to support the cost of this war, which is costing a billion dollars a day. Therefore, it's easy, in a way. People say it's a very complicated situation. No, we just have to turn off the money tap, turn off the arms, and then Israel will have to negotiate and have to change. But the other thing that is necessary is not just arms. There's a boycott bill being put forward by the Tories. Actually, the bill that should be coming forward is that trade and finance with Israel should be illegal. We shouldn't be allowing us to trade with an illegitimate state that we know is going to use that to occupy and oppress the Palestinians. And there's uh, two little stories, really, I want to uh, tell you. I mean, personal, really, but uh, driving over from Dover, and I was seeing the um, uh, nice frosted trees, a Christmassy sort of look. And a few years ago, when I was still allowed to go travel to Palestine, I was there on uh, Christmas Eve, which was the Orthodox Christmas Eve, the 6th of January, in Bethlehem. So my mother, being a good Catholic, I rang her up and said, I'm in Bethlehem on Christmas Eve, and she didn't really believe me. But then I tried to explain what the situation was like. Tour tourists were bussed in uh, by Israeli buses. But Bethlehem is surrounded by the eight metre high wall. It is an encampment and she didn't believe what I was saying. And that's one of our problems in this country. We do not understand the reality of an occupation, of a military occupation. We've not been there, and that sort of life which the Palestinians are undergoing every day is impossible, really, for us to comprehend. And the other story is a Palestinian student who's joined me, I'm obviously a student, you can tell, uh, that uh, joined me on the art course in uh, Canterbury. Um, it's her first time out of Palestine, and she can't believe she can just go out and get a bus and get a train and travel to London and do things because she's not allowed to do that in Palestine. It's a very simple thing, but actually military occupation means that people cannot follow an ordinary life. Uh, and we know that the Gaza bombing is just horrendous. But our responsibility is we've got to make sure there is a fundamental political shift in this country, that we go from being kowtowing to whatever Israel wants to actually making Israel follow international law. And that means that this is not a short, one-off campaign. This means we've got to be campaigning for as long as it takes. Yeah. And it's brilliant that you're here. Join the PSC locally. Join it nationally. Get involved in your university, in your trade union, in your political party, whichever one it is raising the voice of Palestine because when you go there what they say is tell our story and that's what we need to be doing just telling their story we don't need to elaborate the facts the facts speak for themselves but we need to spread it I've just found
going around, people seem to know, know a thing or two about Palestine. But in the pubs, in dinners and meals, everyone wants to talk about it. And they say it's really complicated. I said, no, it's not. International law, end the occupation, sanctions now. It's very, very simple what we need to do. So therefore, what I call on you to do is get organised in your own family, amongst your friends locally. Come on the next demonstration, uh, next Saturday nationally. Watch the next one here. But in the meantime, let's just keep our resolve. And let's just keep on chanting on behalf of the Palestinian people. Their resolve is unbelievable. I just can't imagine what they're living through. <laughs> let's just say we're on their side. Free, free! Palestine! Free, free! Palestine! Free, free! Palestine! See you the next time we have one in Canterbury. Thank you very much for coming today. I have, I have Dr. Awawi here from the Canterbury Mosque who would like to say a few words. So please welcome Dr. Awawi. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. Um, I am a member of the Canterbury Mosque and I have been in Canterbury for nearly 50 years. Half a century. Yeah. About half a century I've been here. We are very close to the precincts of the Canter Canterbury Cathedral, a holy place of this beautiful city of Canterbury. And we, the Muslims, have been part of this society and we love you all, Canterbury and all the district. Now, I have been many times to the Canter Canterbury Cathedral to take part in the Hol Holocaust Memorial, feeling the sympathy for the victims, the Jewish victims, of the war and now you are here in sympathy for the victims of Gaza, of Palestine thank you for doing that uh, I've done that many times in the cathedral in, in sympathy for the Jewish people who suffered and also um, not only me but my colleague Dr. Tamimi has also done that on more than one occasion and we've done that year after year so we have no problem for Jewish people or Christian people or any any faith or people who have no faith now as far as far as the Christians are concerned just a reminder Christians in Palestine are descendants of the world's oldest Christian communities but they are prevented from visiting the most sacred Christian sites in occupied Palestine the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the holiest Christian site, is not accessible to most Palestinian Christians. Bethlehem, the biblical birthplace of Jesus, peace be upon him, has now been surrounded by Israeli roadblocks and checkpoints. There are around one million Palestinian Christians across the world, and you've all heard in the news how the Israelis have bombed the third uh, oldest church in the world in Gaza. Now the list of the crimes of the Israelis against the Palestinians and against uh, Muslims, Christians and Jews. There are a lot of Jewish people who are against what the, what the Israeli um, uh, Zionist regime is doing. It is against Judaism and against the principles of any religion. Now the list of the crimes that are committed by Israel are actually endless. Now in uh, 2003, the Americans attacked Iraq, uh, accusing Iraq of weapons of mass destruction. And at the time, the British people went out. There were hundreds of thousands of people in London, and I was there and many people from all the spectrum of the British people went out and uh, they appealed and the world didn't listen the government didn't listen Tony Blair went ahead with the war people were carrying banners like you are doing now saying no war on Iraq, not in my name many of you remember that but the, unfortunately Britain went ahead and uh, joined America for the destruction of Iraq at the time, one year after I, 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 I did a talk at the University of Kent, 
and I said, where are the weapons of mass destruction? One year after. Now, 20, uh, 23, 2003 to, to, to 2023, that's 20 years, they still haven't found the weapons of mass destruction. And at the time I said, weapons of mass destruction stands for WMDs. WMDs. I said, I know where the weapons of mass destruction, WMDs stand, of, stand for Western Media Deception. Western Media Deception. Now, thanks to the uh, technology and the uh, uh, social media, the truth is coming out between you and me and your neighbor and your friends. We are not listening to the um, official government's um, uh, media. Uh, it's all lies. A lot of it is lies. You know, I sometimes listen to the BBC, unfortunately. I am British. I live here. And I love the people of Britain. And I've done my part in teaching thousands of, of uh, students at Canterbury College and other places, uh, Simon Langton uh, Grammar School, and so on and so on. And I'm proud of that. And many of them have become important people. Now, I'm talking about years of doing that here. Now, what's happening now? Uh, now I know what's happening to orphans of mass destruction. They are being dropped on Gaza by the Americans again. They supplied the weapons. All the Western governments, unfortunately representatives of the Western governments, went the first day of the 7th of October, one by one, starting with the uh, President of the United States of America, followed by many European uh, countries. And they went there and visited uh, Tel Aviv, not, not Gaza, not Palestine. And they said, we are with you, go ahead. Now, one of the sickest phrases that have been used that I am listening to every time, that Israel has the right to defend itself. That means you don't have the right to defend yourself. I don't have the right to defend myself. Palestine doesn't have the right to defend itself. So I say to them, Palestine has the right to, to defend itself. Yes. Now the list, the list goes many, uh, many uh, points about the, um, the Israeli occupation. Apartheid policies, the apartheid wall, all over, all over the occupied Palestine, the West Bank, and everywhere. Okay, yeah. I know you're all get, yes. I'm just going to talk, I'm not going to talk about the history of the Nakba and all the other things. Let's talk about Gaza. Just a few moments and then you, you, you know, I know you are all feeling cold. But just imagine Palestinians, we are dressed with uh, many layers of clothes at this day. The Palestinians in, in Gaza and other parts of Palestine, but especially in Gaza, they are out there, no homes, no water, no food, no medicines. Uh, hospitals are being attacked and they are in the open. And uh, many of them have escaped from their homes, if, if they escaped, if they have not been bombed and they, are, they only have their summer clothes. Gaza has been under Israeli siege by land, air and sea since 2007. This means that nothing can get in or out of Gaza without Israeli permission. Food, water, medicine and fuel are all scarce. 70% of households in Gaza do not have adequate food. As a result of Israel's inhumane siege, over 80% of the population needs humanitarian aid. Gaza is experiencing an electricity crisis. Many households only receive power for a few hours each day. Many thanks for being here. God bless you. And free Palestine. Free, free. Free, free. free, free. Thank you all for coming today um, and please keep in touch with us um, please pick up some of our leaflets so you can find out how to keep in touch um, again thank you for coming and thank you to our wonderful speakers and thank you to Un Unite uh, community for giving us the use of the PA and for their generous donation um, and 
Anybody I've left out? <laughs> and thank you to everybody anyway. Free, free, That's it, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>